The way to heaven is ascending. We must be content to travel uphill, though it all be hard and tiresome, and contrary to the natural bias of our flesh. I would not give one moment of heaven for all the joy and riches in the world, even if it lasted for thousands and thousands of years. Joy is the serious business of heaven. Life, if properly viewed in any aspect, is great, but mainly great when viewed in its relation to the world to come. I would rather go to heaven alone than go to hell in company. If I find myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that it was made for another world. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. The greatest story ever. I grew up in a home uh, with lots of stories. I grew up in, in, a, in a home where reading was a, a highly valued practice. As a matter of fact, in the last couple of weeks, Sherry and I were down in Orange County for my dad's 80th birthday. He's in an intermediate care place now, so his home is sitting empty. So we were kind of doing some cleanup in his home. And in his bedroom, from floor to ceiling, the entire length of the longest wall, and it's a long wall in the bedroom, are books. Bookshelves from floor to ceiling, and in most places, the books are too deep. So you can't see the books behind. There's like two rows of books on every single shelf. And as a young boy, all the way through my teenage years, my parents were giving me book after book. And so I read Heinlein and Bradbury. I got introduced to, to science fiction. I read Edgar Rice Burroughs and different adventure books. And, and the standard of the boys and girls in our family you had the Nancy Drew series and the Hardy Boys series and the Three Investigators series and all these different series of books. And you know, story after story after story. But there were moments in my life where those stories didn't suffice. Those stories didn't meet the deepest needs of my soul. And that was when we came to issues of eternity. The story of eternity. I didn't have a framework for that in my home because my home had no faith. Not a faith in a living God, not a faith in the Bible. And so, and so when I was in third grade and my closest friend David stopped coming to school for a couple of weeks, and then finally the teacher said, oh, D David has something called leukemia. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what cancer was in third grade. I hadn't been exposed to all that at that point. And then when David never came back to school, and then when David passed away and died, and my closest friend, I wasn't allowed to go visit him at home because he was too sick. When the funeral happened, it was during school time, and we couldn't get out of school to go to the funeral. And so sort of at one moment, here's my closest friend, David, and at the next moment, he's gone. And I did what I always did at that time in my life, and, and I've done many, through many years of my life, I went to my dad, who knows a lot about a lot of things, very, very smart man. And I knew if I went to my dad and said, Dad, you know, what happens when someone dies? What happened to David? Where is he now? He, I, didn't have a, I didn't have any categories for this. Edgar Rice Burroughs and, 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 and Heinlein didn't answer those eternal questions in a substantial way. I knew if I went to my dad and asked a question, I knew it would be a long, long, long answer and conversation because that's how my dad was and is. But it was important enough that I went to my dad and said, Dad, what happens when someone dies? What happened to David? And we sat on the edge of his bed and we went into a long conversation. And in that conversation, I heard my dad say to me for the first time something I'd never heard him say before. He said, I don't know. I don't know what happens when someone dies. I don't, I don't have any answers for eternal questions. For a third grader to have your dad say, I don't know, about something that big and important, it made me wonder, could anybody know? But, but he did help me out. He took me over to his bookshelf, and we always, books were kind of an answer to anything. There was always a book about every topic you could talk about. And this, he took me to this exact set of books. And actually, Sherry got this off his shelf when we were there, just down there a couple weeks ago, and, and this is now in my, in my book collection. But, so he gave me a, a series of volumes on Catholicism, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, and Protestantism. 
all with very small print and lots and lots of pages. Now remember, he, put the, he set this series of books in the hands of a third grader. So I read them all. No, I didn't. Uh, I, did, I did what probably any third grader would do. I went back to my room and I put them down and I left them there. And in my heart and my mind, I sort of had this sense, okay, I guess if my dad doesn't know about eternal questions and eternity for people and for, is there something more than this? If my dad doesn't know, then nobody really knows. And for almost a decade, I just kind of put all that on a back shelf. Pushed it away because there, there weren't answers to those. And, and, and really for me, I didn't find answers in any of the stories I'd read up to that point until someone gave me this book, the Bible, God's Word. When someone gave me this book and put this book in my hands and I began to read it and let it go into my heart, I found answers to eternal questions. And you probably have picked up already that today we're, we're going to be talking out of the book of Revelation. It's the last book of, the, of God's great story in the Bible. And as I began to read this book, I'll be honest with you, a lot of things made sense and I got to get a a picture of what heaven would be and that there's more than this life and that through Jesus we can have salvation and those answers started to come. But there was a lot of things when I read this book that didn't make sense. I I was first given a Bible when I was 15, almost 16 years old. And you would say, most people say, well, but you know, I thought you knew, I mean, you knew some about Christianity at that point. I mean, obviously you're you're almost 16 years old. You knew knew that you'd heard the story of David and Goliath. I, I tell you, no. They said, well, you knew that Christmas was about the birth of Jesus. And I would have told you, I had no idea. No, Christmas is about Santa Claus and lots of presents and family. I had no spiritual, well, you, you knew that Easter was about, you at least knew Easter was about the resurrection. I had no idea until I was given the greatest story ever, a story of truth, a story of God's love and God's presence. And, and so as I, as I began to read this book, and I'll tell you now, years later, I wish I could tell you I have everything in the Bible figured out and I, I, have, I know everything and how it all works. There's still parts of the Bible that, that, that baffle me, that I struggle with, I don't fully understand. There's things I grapple with. There's more and more that I do understand and this story speaks truth and this story speaks life and this story gives, gives a framework for an understanding of eternity because this book is the story of eternity. Eternity past and eternity forward. An eternal God who's eternally loving and powerful. In this series, we've been talking about uh, how our God is one God who exists eternally in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we kind of set up our stage with that in mind, just to kind of remind us. So when it comes to eternity, we know this. The Holy Spirit speaks to the church God's people today and every day, preparing us for eternity. When we worship one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit on our staging, we kind of use this front place to talk about God, the Holy Spirit, and to understand that the God we worship is moving in our lives right now, preparing us for eternity. Now, here's the key for a Christian. Eternity does not begin when you die. Eternity begins when you have new life in Jesus. That's when your eternity with Jesus begins. The moment you come to the cross, confess your sin, and receive Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit moves into you and lives in you and never leaves you. And now you learn to walk and live in a way that's preparing you for eternity. Now listen closely. Doing good things doesn't get you into heaven. But when you know Jesus and the Holy Spirit moves into you, you learn to live more for Jesus. In this life, in a sense, we're preparing to meet him face to face. And in this life, we get tastes of worship and tastes of fellowship, and tastes of of God's goodness and presence, and it's powerful and overwhelming and beautiful, but what's going to happen in eternity when we see him face to face is going to blow all that away. It's going to be so far beyond that we can't comprehend it, But, but the Holy Spirit is preparing us for eternity. Now, Jesus Christ, God the Son, this one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Jesus prepares us for eternity because he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The Bible teaches that Jesus came to this world, God in human flesh. He lived a perfect life with no sin. And yet he bore our sins and took our shame and took our punishment. And on the cross, he paid the price for us. The Lamb of God, slain before the foundation of the world. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The perfect sacrifice for us in our place. And he died and he rose again in glory. And Jesus made a way. This God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit are leading us in this journey of eternity. And then the Father is the center of worship today, every day, and for all of eternity. This space appears to remind us that God the Father, who looks over us and who loves his creation, 
He is the focal point. He's the center of eternity. And so when Pastor John was talking about this song in heaven, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Verse three of the song. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Verse 147. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. That's the center point, the focal point. I don't think heaven's gonna be just sitting and singing one song with one verse, but the point is this. God, our Father, is the center of our worship. And if eternity begins when you become a Christian, you get more passionate about worshiping him. When? All the time. Where? Everywhere you are. And so we'll talk about that, and we'll think about that together today as we think about the story of eternity. In a few moments, I'm going to have a couple of our church members come, and they're going to read a number of passages from the book of Revelation. And I'm going to ask you to listen and to open up your heart and to hear what God says. But, but I want to kind of set the framework for that. I want to ask you a question, because in the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3 are these letters to the churches, to these seven different churches, and in each letter something unique happens. But I want to ask you a question. I'm going to give you a scenario of three kinds of parents. And you tell me who's the best parent of these three, all right? Three kinds of parents, and in your mind decide who's the best parent. Parent number one is the parent who always sees the good, always notices the good in their child and praises and affirms and tells them that's wonderful, that's great, that's incredible. And it's they always notice the good and they affirm and bless it and that's their focal point of everything. Okay? Parent number two. They always see the struggles, the challenges and where their child needs to grow and do better. And so they lovingly point out those things and help and challenge their child to grow and to mature and to become a better person. Parent number one always notices the good and celebrates it. Parent number two always notices the growth areas and challenges them. Or parent number three does both. Who's the best parent? Parent number three. Parent number one's going to have a kid who's going to think that they are, uh, as the kids are saying today, the bees, knees, the cat's pajamas, and the best thing since sliced bread. Right? And the, the parent number one's going to raise a kid who's going to think, I'm amazing, I'm incredible, and doesn't realize their frailties. Parent number two is going to probably discourage their child because what they always notice are the challenges But it's the parent who notices both and speaks to both that is the most loving parent. Well, God is our perfect heavenly parent. So when he writes these letters to the churches, he inspires these through John and this revelation that he sees. In each of the letters to the churches, God points out the really good things he sees and he says, keep doing that, that's great. And then every time God says, but there's also this. And you gotta really work on that and grow in that area. That's the heart of our God. He is a perfect parent who will celebrate the steps we're taking that are good, but who will challenge us where we need to grow. Just like he did to the churches in the ancient world, he does to his people today. And so I'm going to pray, and I'm going to ask God to speak to us through his word. As I pray, uh, Terry and Betsy Davis are going to come and join me, and they're going to share some scripture, and I'm going to ask you to listen closely. But let's pray together. Lord Jesus, speak to our hearts right now. As we finish this journey through the greatest story ever, Lord, here at Shoreline, we're going to just keep preaching the Bible every week, but we're finishing this New Testament study, and we're finishing in the book of Revelation. So, Lord, will you prepare us to hear, not just with our ears, but to hear with a picture in our minds of the beauty and the glory of heaven and of you and of what you have done and of what you are doing and of what you will do. Help us hear and see a vision from you We pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Well, the book of Revelation, which you're going to hear uh, some some nice portions of, the book of Revelation was a vision. So when you listen, when, when Terry and Betsy read these passages, this is my challenge to you. Don't just listen with your ears, but listen with your mind and sort of on the screen of your mind. If it helps you when they're reading the scriptures to close your eyes, that's fine. But but I want you when you listen to these scriptures, because they were originally a vision that John had, he saw these things and heard these things and then he wrote them down led by the Holy Spirit. So the best way to hear Revelation is to actually see it. So as you listen, open your minds and your eyes to see it. Also notice this. In each of the letters of the churches, we'll read some of them and you can read the rest on your own if you've been doing the reading you read through the book of Revelation in the last week. But in each of these letters, there's, there's a couple things that happen. And if, if you love good theological words, here's two great ones for you. Orthodoxy and orthopraxy. Orthodox, in every one of the letters, it deals with orthodoxy and orthopraxy. Orthodoxy is correct belief, making sure we believe the right things. Orthodoxy is about our belief and our understanding, that it is scriptural, biblical, and accurate. Orthopraxy is about right behavior, right living. And orthopraxy is about knowing that we're living the way that God calls us to live. So when God speaks, I want you to notice, he both talks about what the people of God believe, 
but also what they do. Because you can have all the right beliefs and live a horrible life. You can live a you know, nice-looking life on the outside but have all the wrong beliefs. These have to come together. So, so I invite you to listen for those. And, and right now, as we turn to the Scriptures, I'm going to ask you just to listen with your ears but with your heart and on the screen of your mind. Try to see this Scripture and let it come alive in your heart and your mind as we listen to these words from Revelation chapter 2. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. The Holy Spirit blesses and strengthens. As you're listening, I hope you notice that. You hear things like this where the Spirit is saying to the people of God, I know your deeds and what you do. I know that you work hard. I know that you persevere. I know that you're hanging in there. You're not turning away from your faith. And for us, it's hard to understand what it's talking about because we don't necessarily understand that, that time of history, but this is a time where Christians were being radically persecuted. There's parts of the world right now where Christians are being radically persecuted, where their lives are on the line. That was the case back then in that part of the world. Even John himself, who, who wrote this vision, history tells us that John was t tremendously persecuted for his faith, that, he, that they actually tried to kill him by boiling him alive. And he didn't die. They exiled him to this island. So here he is. He's been exiled. He's been abused. He's been physically tormented. His body is just wrecked through this whole experience. And, and, he's, and he's saying, led by the Holy Spirit to the people Hang in there. God bless you for your strength and for holding on. The book of Revelation is interesting because there's people who get so tied up in and kind of caught up into the whole figuring out the book of Revelation and they want to know what everything means and is it representing this and they kind of take the, take the, the local news, online news and what's going on and what's happening in Revelation they try to figure it all out. As a young Christian, there was a few churches around where I lived down in Orange County like every single week was book of Revelation week at church and they were trying to figure it all out. When I was in seminary, I read a commentary. A commentary is just a, it's just a book written by a scholar on a certain book of the Bible. And you can have a book of the Bible that's five pages long, and their commentary is like 600 pages long. It goes to all the history, background, language, all that kind of stuff. And so there's a guy named Robert Mounts, one of the best, uh, he's no longer living, but, but he was one of the best Greek scholars on the planet uh, during his day. And he wrote not just one commentary in the book of Revelation, but two entire books in the book of Revelation. And, he, and Robert Mounts said this, he said, the book of Revelation really means to say only two things. That's all. It's, it's very simple. He actually said, I, one of these, he says, it's one of the easiest books in the Bible to understand. He says, because it means to say just two things. But listen, this is brilliant. This is a brilliant scholar. He says, number one, the book of Revelation says this. God wins. Isn't that good? You read the book of Revelation, God's on the throne. He rules. He reigns. Evil's thrown down. God's lifted up. God wins. I like that. He said, Here, here's the second message of the book of Revelation. He says, hang in there and hold on to Jesus until you see that number one is true and God wins. Then he goes on for another 600 pages about lots of other stuff, right? But, but it, it, it's amazing when you read the book of Revelation, you discover that what God is saying is, listen, understand that I'm on the throne, I rule and reign. And so, so the Spirit says, and, and the Spirit of Jesus says to the, these churches, you've endured hardship for my name, you've not grown weary, you've persevered, you have hung in there even though it's been tough. And I think the Spirit of God still speaks to the church today and says to Christians, to our brothers and sisters in parts of the world where there's radical persecution, but here in our culture where there's, there's a lot of people being pushed to walk away from their faith, there's a lot of mocking going on, cultural mocking or different kinds of kind of mocking the church and mocking Christians. But I think the Spirit of God would say, but you hold on and you haven't grown weary. Or even when it's tough and you're growing weary, you don't let go of Jesus because God wins. So you hold on to Jesus till you see it's all true. The Spirit of God spoke to the church back then and said, listen, you have held fast to your faith when a lot of things push against it. 
And can I say to all of you here at Shoreline Church, all the people online in our family worship venue, bless you for holding strong to Jesus when a lot of the world is walking away. It was true back then, and it's true today. But, but, then, but then the scriptures continue, and that story unfolds. So God, like a loving parent, says, I bless you for standing strong, for persevering. That's great. But the Holy Spirit also challenges and prepares the people of God to keep living for Jesus. So listen to this. He says, yet I hold this against you. Oh, there, there, there's a, yet I hold this against you. You've forsaken the love you had at first. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent, turn around, and do the things you did at first. So, so the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Jesus and, and the Spirit of our Father speaks to the church then and today and says, bless you for hanging in there and standing strong in your faith. But then the Holy Spirit says this, but there was a time in your faith when your love for Jesus was so passionate and was so deep and was so devoted and your heart's kind of grown cold. You show up at church, you go through the motions, you do the religious stuff. But man, that passion for Jesus has grown cold. He says, get back to where you used to be. And I don't think it's even getting back to what it used to be. Have a new fresh day of God's work and God's spirit. And you fall in love with God again. Walk with Jesus closely again. And I think the spirit would say to the church today the same thing. Follow Jesus. Fall in love with him again and again. Look back at those moments where you felt close to him and intimate and connected when you were passionate about worship and church and fellowship and serving and living for Jesus. And say, God, reclaim my heart and take me there again. God wants us to walk and live in that kind of a place. So that message to the church is both bless you for hanging in there, but make sure your love for God is burning hot. What's the passion of your heart for Jesus today? And you need to say to God, God, rekindle the fire. Reignite my heart. Again, the book of Revelation is meant to be seen as a vision more than heard. So in the, in the picture of your mind and as your ears listen, listen to these words from Revelation chapter two. To the angel of the church of Pergamum write, these are the words of him who has a sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Ephesus, my fearful, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Again, the Holy Spirit blesses and strengthens. And we need to hear this. He's saying, he's saying you, you live, he says, you in, in Pergamum, you live in a setting, in a place where, that's where like Satan has his throne. I don't think it means literally that Satan, like that's his house. But the point is, man, Satan is alive there. Satan is powerful there. There is evil going on. And it's not something that's kind of hidden. It's out in the open and it's just there. And he says, listen, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You hang in there. So there's that word of blessing. You're standing strong even when there's persecution, even when there's temptation. I think the Spirit says that to us today. So we don't live in Pergamum, but I tell you, there's more and more and more places in our world where evil is not some hidden thing kind of pushed off to the side of culture and society. It's just right there in the front. It's like on the front burner. It's right there. It's in front of you. And, and I think that God says, listen, hold on to me when evil is present, when there's struggle, where there's temptation, and God celebrates and rejoices when we hold strong. I was thinking about just how, how the enemy, how Satan doesn't care what it takes to get you to walk away from Jesus or to stay distant from Jesus. He doesn't care what it takes. He just doesn't want you near Jesus. So it could be a health challenge. It could be a, a moral choice. It could be a scheduling issue where you're just so busy. It could be some hobby that consumes every minute of your life. So you're not. Satan doesn't care what he uses. He just wants us not close to Jesus. And oftentimes the enemy uses pain in life. And sometimes in our deepest moments of pain, instead of running to God, we run away from God. One of the things that Terry and Betsy as a couple lead here at Shoreline is, is, is our grief share ministry. People that have, that have lost loved ones, people who have gone through deep pain and deep loss and deep struggle. And they walk together and care for each other. But what they call people to do is to hold to Jesus, to, to find out that, that there is a truth and a hope in the midst of your pain and your loss that as bad and deep as that is, there's something bigger than all of that. And that is the love and the presence of Jesus. And, and, and so to hear the Spirit speak to you and say, I know you're in a place where there's incredible temptation and evil and garbage in our world. And I think it just gets worse and worse as time goes on. 
But there's this blessing that when you hold fast to Jesus, no matter what you face. But then in that same passage to that same church, the Holy Spirit challenges and prepares. He says, nevertheless, in verse 14, nevertheless, I have a few things against you. I bless you for this. I have a few things against you. Well, is, is God being mean? No, God is a perfect parent. He's saying, here's what I bless. Here's what's good. I celebrate this. Here's where you need to grow. And I'm going to challenge you to grow. That's the best heavenly parent. That's the best human parent, is that balance. And so God goes on, and, and he addresses issues of orthodoxy and orthopraxy, of belief and of behavior. He says, there are some among you who hold the teaching of Balaam, this is a false teaching, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols, like one of the worst sins in all the history of Israel is idolatry, following after idols instead of after God, and committed sexual immorality. Those two things right side by side are, are a picture for us. He says, he says, here's what's happening for some of you. You're compromising your belief and you're worshiping idols and false gods. Orthodoxy is waning. You're not holding the truth. And, he says, and you're also compromising in your sexuality. That's just an example of any of dozens and dozens of sins that could have been used. But the point is this. At that time, they were compromising their belief, which compromised their lifestyle. And when you start to compromise your belief, your lifestyle starts to compromise. So the Spirit of Jesus says to them and to us, watch what you believe and know what you believe and hold to it. Know the Word of God and don't compromise on it and let what you believe transform how you live and inform how you live and guide how you live. Orthodoxy, orthopraxy. Right belief, right behavior. They go hand in hand. And so the Spirit of God says, I'm watching and you're compromising your belief and you're compromising your lifestyles. Don't do that. And the same word that the Spirit spoke to the church back then, the Spirit would speak to us today and call us to walk with Jesus and to live close to him. And then the book of Revelation continues on in Revelation chapter four. And I want you to focus now in the picture of your mind on what it says about the Father who is the center of worship. In that central place today, every day, and for eternity. Listen to God's word and see this picture of God the Father being central in worship. Hear God's word. And there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby. A rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. In the center, around the throne, were four living creatures. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will... They were created, and they have their being. Worship of God, the Father, is central to our relationship with him now and forevermore. When we think of God the Father, God Almighty, worshiping him, celebrating him, acknowledging him, is central to all that we do. So the question is, are we walking as people day by day who are attuned to God's presence and worshiping him? What, what, when, when do I worship? I come to, I'm here at church. I'm a worshiper. I, mean, I, 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 I punch the worship clock. I'm here for, you know, it's not just an hour. It's an hour and 10 minutes usually. I mean, I'm, I come to church. I mean, I'm a worshiper. Great. And I would say like God would say, God bless you for that, but there's more. Uh, my, my wife, uh, Sherry, has written a book that's all about praying all the time. The book is called Praying with Eyes Wide Open. And it's about praying and worshiping and connecting with God all the time. We're going to do a four-week series on that later in the year. And Sherry and I are going to actually team teach the series as a couple going through what it really looks like to, to worship and to pray and to talk with God, to relate with God all the time. And if you're, going to, if you're going to worship God all the time, guess what? Sometimes your eyes are going to be open. Otherwise, you're going to drive off the road 
or you're going to get in all kinds of trouble, right? And so, and so we need to look and say, God, my Father, if the heavenly beings, like Pastor John reminded us, are worshiping day and night, I want to become that kind of worshiper. And so I believe the Spirit of God would say to us, do you understand that God is not only worthy of your praise and worthy of your worship when you're in church, but God's just as worthy of worship at Friday night at 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock at night or at Friday night or early Saturday morning at 2 in the morning. Wherever you are, whatever you say, can, can I worship God here? Do I acknowledge God's presence and connect with him? We need to be just staggered by God's beauty and celebrate his creation like these heavenly beings are just declaring and falling down and worshiping. Here's the challenge. Will you grow as a worshiper? Will you express your heart more fully when we gather like this? But will you express your heart of praise and worship to God wherever you go, whenever it is, at all times? And we're going to be learning as a congregation what that looks like to live a life with eyes wide open and worshiping and praying and seeking God at every moment, all the time. And then the book of Revelation, one last portion we're going to look at is, is this. Jesus prepares us for eternity because he's the Lamb of God. These scriptures that talk about Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, what he's done and how he's moving and working. And so listen to God's word from the book of Revelation. And again, in your mind, picture this scene unfolding. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll. And to open the seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God persons of every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them into a kingdom and priests to serve your, our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice, they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and, and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on a throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. And so here's our God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Here's Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who, who bears and bore the sins of the world. And here's the elders, they fall down and they worship. Here's the heavenly beings, they worship and they celebrate. Here's every creature in heaven and earth and every being celebrating and glorifying God and this Jesus Christ who is the Lamb of God. Eternity doesn't begin when you die. If you've come to the cross and received Jesus, your eternity with the living God has started already. The Holy Spirit of God has moved in. And if you become a Christian, at Shoreline, any given week, we have hundreds of people that are part of our church online, on our different campuses, here in Iglesia Shoreline, English and Spanish. We have hundreds of people that don't yet know Jesus. You say, well, how do you know that? Because when we invite people to receive Jesus, we'll have 10, 15, 20, 25, 40, 50 people receive Jesus. We have lots of people coming that are still trying to figure out all this. And so if you're in that place where you're still trying to understand who Jesus is and what he's done, I just encourage you to open your heart and realize that when you come to Jesus, eternity with God begins now. And right now what we get is we get a foretaste. We get a sample. You ever been to Costco? And at Costco they offer you like free samples just because they're nice and they love giving stuff away, right? No. They want you to have, try a sample so that you will buy more. I'll take a whole box of these. I'll take a whole rack of these. I'll take a case of these that's larger than my car. Uh, and and you know, they're, they're, they, they give you a sample because the sample lets you understand, oh, this is something I want more of. As you walk through this life, as you walk with Jesus, as you worship him, in those great moments where you, you're gathered with God's people and you sense the presence of God, it's a sample. There's so much more. 
When you're on your own at home and you're reading the scriptures and God speaks to you in a really personal way, or the Spirit of God whispers or shouts aloud some truth, you go, I get it. I understand it. You sense God's presence in that moment. That's a sample of what lies ahead. There's more. Eternity awaits us who have come to put our faith in Jesus. An eternity with our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the story he has told and he is telling will continue to be told for all of eternity. And as a third grader, I didn't understand that. And it didn't make sense. But when I've come to know this story of God's grace and God's goodness, it changes everything. I hope and pray that you walk in a knowledge of that story and in the presence of Jesus. And if you don't yet, talk with any of our pastors and say, I want to know more about Jesus. Or keep coming to Shoreline because we keep sharing the story again and again and again. Oh God, thank you for the story that you have been writing, the story that you are writing today, and the story that will carry us into eternity for everyone who's bowed their knee and surrendered their heart to Jesus Christ. And now, Lord, as we go from here, let us not wait until next week to come back to worship. Let us walk in your presence, hearing your loving, fatherly voice saying, I bless and I encourage what you're doing here and grow here because you want us to become the men and women that would most glorify you and bring you praise. Thank you for the hope of eternity that we have secured in Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name, amen.